John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 14, is where you'll find the phrase that we want to consider this evening. It's really the opening uh, statement of this verse, although we're going to take the whole verse uh, because, as you imagine, it's all connected. But the phrase that's on the window here to my left uh, is, The Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh. Let's bow together in prayer, and we need the Lord's help. Our Father, we do pray that Thou will bless Thy Word to us this evening as we come around the truth of God to meditate upon it. We pray that it will be with blessing to our hearts and power to us. And, O oh Lord, may we rejoice in that day when Jesus Christ came into this world, was made flesh. What a glorious day that was. We have been singing about that already in this service that there was that day. And Lord, we thank Thee that the whole history of the world revolves around that one day when Christ came into this world and that day that He died. And Lord, we thank Thee that we can rejoice in it tonight and we pray that that might be true for each and every one of us. So come and bless Thy Word, we ask now. Give help to hear. Give me that added help to preach. For we ask in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. Amen. We've been considering some of the statements that are within this uh, auditorium itself because we're marking 30 years uh, since the building was open. And the main uh, theme that runs through uh, the statements that are found along the windows and even the one that's behind me as well, up on the window above me, uh, is to do with the Word, either the Word of God inspired or the Word of God incarnate. And those along uh, this set of windows uh, has to do with the Word of God incarnate, and those along the windows here uh, on the other side, and the one behind me on the window above me, has to do with the Word of God inspired. And we're working our way through these themes. We're going to finish off with uh, the other text up on the wall here, Redemption Through the Blood, because... Uh, when we think about all that the, the inspired word and, and the incarnate word, uh, then we'll come to think about the blood and the importance of that in the preaching of the gospel as, as well. But we've worked our way uh, along at least one side here, taking really those three statements that are found in John 1 and verse 1. We thought about the word and how we are to understand uh, this term in the scriptures, and then we considered those three statements. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there are three of those statements on one window each here along my left-hand side. <clears throat> and that brings us then to the fourth one, and it is that opening statement of verse 14. The Word was made flesh. And that's what we want to consider uh, this evening, the Word was made flesh, because John has established certain truths about the Word as to who he is, and we thought about uh, that going away back into eternity. He's God. He's God, a very God. And we thought about that last Lord's Day evening, but now we want to come to think about uh, something else, and that John is emphasizing here his incarnation. The Word was made flesh. This one who is the eternal being became a man, took our nature upon himself. So the first statement that you have there in verse 14 is that the Word was made flesh. And we want to think about that itself and what is um, uh, contained in, in that statement. Because as it's very obvious, that, that uh, term is referring to his incarnation. And yet, what great important truths are there that, that are connected with the coming of Christ into this world and the taking of our nature into union with himself? It's one thing to say he, he, there was the incarnation. It's one thing to say he was made flesh. But what exactly does that mean? And there are some truths that we need to safeguard uh, when we're thinking about that. Because it was not a part of a human body that Christ took he took a whole human nature into union with himself. He took a whole hum human nature. If you know your shorter catechism, you will know that there is that answer that emphasizes Christ taking a true body and a reasonable soul. And for those that have gone through the catechism, the Sunday school, 
and you've learned those particular answers, you will know that there, there's one of those answers, and that's the, the, the wording that's contained in it, that referring to Christ coming into this world and taking our nature, being made flesh, it says that he had a true body and a reasonable soul. And those two statements are put in there to emphasize the truth that Christ did not just take part of human nature, he took all of human nature. He took to himself a human body, but he also took to himself a human soul, a reasonable soul, a rational soul, is what he took to himself. So that's why I say it's important that we, when we consider this statement that we do safeguard some great truths about the nature of the God-man and his coming into this world and taking our nature. For example, as well, you see, it was real human nature that he took and not not a phantom human nature. He didn't just appear as a man. He actually took our nature. He actually was made flesh. And there's some other statements that you have in the Word of God that, that supports that. For example, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under the law. So he was born of a woman. He had true human nature. Now, over the summertime there, you'll remember that on the Lord's Day mornings, we were thinking about some of those pre-incarnation appearances of the Lord Jesus. We thought about Melchizedek, for one, and some others uh, as well, the Lord appearing to Jacob and also to, to Joshua. But those were, those were not uh, real incarnations. The Lord took on the appearance of a man when he was Melchizedek or the man that wrestled with Jacob or the man, the, the captain of the Lord's host that appeared to, to Joshua. He took on the appearance of a man. He wasn't really and truly a man because that was prior to his incarnation. But that's not what happened when at Bethlehem Jesus Christ took our nature and was made flesh and was born of a woman. It was, it was something more. He was really and truly born of a woman. He really and truly took our nature our true body and a reasonable soul into union with himself. It was real human nature. It wasn't just the appearance. And that's very important when we come to consider the matter of redemption. It's not an elementary truth. It's not a truth that you can say, well, it really doesn't matter. Sure, why make such a big deal out of Christ becoming really and truly a man? It is important because it's important because it's human nature that needs to be redeemed. Remember that. Christ took the nature that needed to be redeemed into union with himself. That was his purpose in coming into the world, that he would take on that nature that needed to be redeemed, that he was going to redeem. He didn't take on the nature of angels because he wasn't going to redeem angels. As we know, the angels that fell into sin are not redeemed. They never will be redeemed. Christ never took on the nature of angels. He never had any intentions of taking on the nature of angels. From eternity past, it was the purpose of God that he would take on the nature of humanity. He would take on that nature that was going to be redeemed, that needed to be redeemed. And that's human nature. That's the nature that you and I have. So it is very important then that we, that we emphasize that point and that the Word of God emphasizes it, whether it's here in John 1, 14 or Galatians 4 and verse 4 or over in 1 Timothy three sixteen. Uh, you have it there as well, where there's the emphasis upon his, his manifestation in the flesh. Uh, Timoth, 1 Timothy 3, 16, But without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So there are those great statements in the Word of God that emphasizes Christ did indeed take humanity. And we rejoice in that because that means there's a Savior then for humanity. There's a way back to God tonight for humanity. There's a means whereby humanity can be forgiven and can be redeemed and can have their sins blotted out because there's one, there's one who came to be the Savior and really and truly took our nature into union with himself. Because as we know, part of redemption, part of working out redemption was Christ becoming the representative of those who were going to be saved. He became their representative. He did for them what they could not do for themselves. He lived a perfect life and therefore obtained eternal life and all the blessings that come with eternal life. Christ did that. 
as he lived in human nature. He bore the penalty of sin that ought to have fallen upon human nature, that ought to have fallen upon you and I, and every other individual that has sinned as well. We are subject to the wrath of God, and the wrath of God ought to have fallen upon us and consumed us in an instant. The wrath of God fell upon human nature as it was in union with Jesus Christ. So in order to to have true redemption, it's absolutely essential that the Word was made flesh and that we rejoice in this glorious truth when it's stated in in the Word of God. He, He took really and truly our nature into union with Himself. And that means tonight there's a Savior for humanity. There's a Savior for humanity. There's a Savior for fallen sinners. And it is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the, uh, he's the only Savior, because there's only one individual who's ever done this, a God-man taking our nature. It tells you there in John 1.14 that he was made flesh, that he was made flesh. And there is a mystery, as, as Paul tells us there in 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. There's a mystery here, how God the Son considering those statements that you have in John 1 and verse 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When you think about that divine person, the second person of the Trinity, and here he is coming down into, taking into union with himself, our nature, being born of the Virgin Mary. There's a mystery in that. There, there, there are elements to that we cannot fully ever understand and comprehend. But there are some things that we can certainly emphasize, as we have been doing. But there are some other matters here as well. You know, he was made flesh not by changing or exchanging one nature for another. He didn't change his divine nature into a human nature. The Word did not change and become a man. The Word remained what he always was. He was the Word, as those three statements at the beginning of John's Gospel says. He's the Word, and he's, he's an eternal person. But he took into union with himself our nature. So we don't say that the divine became human. No, the divine took into union with himself a human nature. He did not change. He added, he added something. When he took our nature into personal union with him, with himself, and neither of those natures were changed or altered. The divine didn't become human. The human didn't become divine. You know, there wasn't some kind of a third nature that was the, the, the product of the Son of God uniting with our nature. There wasn't some kind of a, of a third nature that was formed as a result of that. The divine always remained divine. The human always remained human. There are two distinct natures in Jesus Christ. One human and one divine. Uh, one divine. He is one person, but there are two distinct human, there are two distinct natures in this person. He was made flesh. Amazingly, if you would turn over to Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, it tells us that he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. So John tells us that he was made in in uh, that he was made flesh, the word was made flesh. But listen to what Paul here has to say in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In the likeness of sinful flesh. So that, that nature that he took upon himself had the likeness of sinful flesh. It wasn't sinful flesh. As we know, Jesus Christ was without sin. So there was no sin in him. He was, he was the perfect one, the sinless one. In him was no guile at all. But he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. And in doing that, for example, he became subject to all the infirmities that are associated with sin. When he came into this world, he, he didn't live apart from men. He came into this world and 
All the, the, the miseries of this life that you and I are subject to because we are sinners, Christ became subject to those as well. He knew what it was to be weary and tired. He knew what it was to hunger and thirst. He knew all of those things that, that are part and parcel of sinful flesh. Yet, he himself was without sin. How really and how truly Christ took our nature. How really and how truly he took our nature. And one other truth just to emphasize here before we move on. That union will never be dissolved. And surely here's the wonder of it and the condescension of it. Christ took our nature never to reverse that union. When he was made flesh, there was never going to be a time, there never will be a time when that will be reversed. And he will put off flesh. He will put off the nature that he took. He is taken into union with himself. He was made flesh and he will keep that nature for all of eternity. Tonight he has that nature in the glory. The word of God assures us that he has ascended and that he is at his father's right hand. But he is at his father's right hand in glorified human nature. The nature that he has now is his divine nature and glorified human nature. And he will never divest himself of that nature. It will never be dissolved. Because if it did, you see, that would impact our salvation. That would mean that the whole work of redemption then would, would fall to the ground if Christ ever did that, and he never will. He has got a union that will never be dissolved. He has done that for all of eternity. And therein lies the condescension of the Son of God taking our nature, taking our nature, and taking that into union with himself, never to dissolve that union never to divest himself of that nature. It says he was not ashamed to call them his brethren. He took our nature, became a brother in flesh in that sense. What a wonder. What a wonder. But all absolutely necessary tonight for the saving of sinners. There would be no salvation if Christ Jesus had not done this. So he is the one who, who was made flesh. Then I want you to notice secondly out of this verse, because these statements are all connected, that in being made flesh, he dwelt among us. The word dwelt there in that line, 1 John 1, 14, is the word tabernacled. He came and lived for a time. He tabernacled in this world. Well, he did not come permanently to the world. He only came to tabernacle for a time. But there was a purpose in, in that tabernacling. It is, it is reckoned that somewhere around 33 years, Jesus Christ was here on earth. He started his earthly ministry at 30 years of age. He saw three Passovers, which is just more than three years. So if you add just more than three years onto his 30 years, old Wellesley, when he began his earthly ministry, we're coming up somewhere to 33 and a half years. He was tabernacling in this world. He never came to live permanently in this world. It was only ever to tabernacle in this world. But there was a purpose in him coming to tabernacle in this world. Look at verse 14 again. And the words that are in brackets, it says, And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Is that the one of the reasons why he came to tabernacle in this world, that men might behold him? And see something of his glory. And there were some men who did see something of his glory. Those disciples saw something of his glory. Others realized him to, to be the Messiah. Realized him to, to be the Lord of glory. There were those who did to some degree indeed see something of the glory that was in him. The glory is only of the only begotten of the Father. But in thinking about his, his dwelling upon earth, there are some other points I would like to draw to your attention with regarding this. You see, he, he dwelt, he tabernacled among men so that there would be no doubt as to the reality of his incarnation. We, we have thought there about the importance of his incarnation and, and said that it's absolutely essential for the matter of salvation. 
Well, is tabernacling in this world for those 33 and a half years or so was with the purpose of proving the reality of his incarnation. He did not appear for a few moments like a phantom or a ghost. He did not come down for a brief visit of a few days and then return to heaven. He lived among men. He lived among men for a whole generation almost. For 33 years and a little bit he pitched his tent in Palestine and is going to and fro among the people. For example, in the Acts of the Apostles chapter 10 and verse 38, it says he went about doing good. He traveled about. He moved about among that generation among whom he was born and upon whom he came into this world. And he did it with the purpose in showing that his incarnation was real. There were those who knew him. There were those who grew up with him. There were those who on one occasion said, Is not this Joseph's son? They didn't realize who he was in reality. They just thought he was an ordinary human individual. And they said, those Jews that had lived in in Nazareth, they said, is not this Joseph's son? Are not his brothers with us? And they named his brothers as well. They, They looked upon him as an ordinary human individual. And Christ tabernacled in this world for that purpose of proving his incarnation. It was true. He really and truly was a man. And when you think about you know, those pre-incarnation appearances of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament, they were very fleeting. How long did Melchizedek appear for? How long did that man that wrestled with Jacob appear for? How long did that captain of the Lord's hosts appear to Joshua? That night before the battle of Jericho, and, or the week that started with uh, the marching around and then the defeat of Jericho. How, how, how long, how fleeting were, were those appearances? But how long did Christ, when he took our nature, how long did he tabernacle among men? For almost a whole generation, he was in this world proving that he really and truly was a man. He really and truly took our nature into union with himself. But this dwelling with us, as we have it in John 1 and 14, does that not remind us something of the Passover lamb as well? Because in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, it tells us even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And you will know something of the significance of selecting the Passover lamb. It had to be selected some days prior to that Passover sacrifice. It had to be kept so to establish its purity. It was observed that there was no sickness and no illness and no lameness in any way in the Passover lamb. We're told back in in Exodus chapter 12 that they were to select it on the 10th day of the month and then it was to be sacrificed on the 14th day of the month. So there was a period of time in which the Passover lamb was observed, closely observed, so that there would be no possibility at all that that lamb had any flaws in it at all. It wasn't sick, it wasn't lame, it wasn't ill. There was no flaws in that lamb. It had to be without spot and without blemish. Did Jesus Christ tabernacle in this world to establish his purity? Isn't that very important when we come to think about him being the Passover lamb, the sacrifice for sin? Isn't it very important that he is without spot and without blemish? Isn't that why his sacrifice has got value tonight? It's because he was without sin. He was flawless. Without spot and without blemish are the same words that Peter uses in First Peter with regards to Christ, the Passover lamb, speaking there about his precious blood and being redeemed. With that precious blood, he said, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. It's because of his spotlessness. It's because that he was without blemish. That's what gives his, val- his blood so much value and worth. It was sinless blood. The taint of sin runs in your blood and my blood. The taint of sin is in us. But there was no taint of sin in Christ's blood. His was sinless blood. And just as the Passover lamb was observed for a period of time in order to establish its purity, 
Was Jesus Christ not in this world to establish his purity? Was that not something that was particularly established coming, come the end of his, his life? And it wasn't even his friends that, that were used to establish his purity. It was his enemies. Herod established his purity. Christ was sent to Herod by Pilate. Pilate thought he could uh, excuse himself from ever having to make a decision, and he sent Jesus Christ to Herod. Herod examined him, set him at naught, it tells us, mocked him, but sent him back to Pilate and said, I find no fault in this man. Pilate himself, on seven different occasions, acknowledged that there was no fault in Jesus Christ. Judas Iscariot, Oh, how Judas Iscariot's conscience would have been solved if he could find, if he could have found some fault in Jesus Christ. That man was was driven to to death by the horror of what he had done. And what did he cry when he came into the high priest in the temple and he threw down the thirty pieces of silver on the floor and he said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. That's what added his soul. That's what took him out and drove him to his death, was the fact that he had betrayed innocent blood and his conscience was awakened to that fact. I have betrayed the innocent blood. And right at the end of Christ's earthly life, prior to him going to be put to death, there was established his purity, not by his friends who could have been accused of being biased towards him and saying, well, sure, you would have expected them to say that anyway, but those who were his enemies, those who would have been, would have been only too glad to have found fault in him. Pilate would have loved to have found fault in Christ, for that man would have excused what he did. He wouldn't have had to wash his hands to try to wash away the guilt of what he had done if he had found fault in Christ. But he found no fault, and he knew there was no fault in Jesus Christ. Herod likewise, and Judas Iscariot, all of them would have loved to have found fault in Jesus Christ, and none of them could. Every one of them testified to his purity. Did Christ tabernacle among men to establish his purity? So that then when he went to the cross and became the the, the Passover lamb, As Paul tells us there in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. There had been already established his purity. He tabernacled among men to establish his purity. He came among men that he might be the offering for sin. The writer of Hebrews tells us Something of why he came into the world and dwelt in the world. Hebrews chapter 9, 26, it says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He has appeared. He has come into the world. He has tabernacled in the world. Why? To put away sin by one sacrifice of himself. That that nature that he took was going to become the sin offering. That nature that he took when he was born of the virgin, made of a woman, as Galatians 4 and 4 describes it. That that nature, if if we want to use the language of, of Hebrews, a body hast thou prepared me, is what is said of Christ. A body hast thou prepared me, prepared for me. And there's Christ speaking to his Father with regards to the incarnation and the mystery of the incarnation as he was born of a woman. A body was prepared for him. Prepared for what? To become the sin offering. And that that body that he took into union with himself, that true, true body, true humanity, reasonable soul, became the sin offering. And he might put away sin by one sacrifice of himself. This is why he dwelt in the world. Oh, he came into the world to 
revealed something of who he was, but he came into the world to save sinners. And he had to save sinners by a sacrifice of himself. He had to make a sacrifice of himself. And he tabernacled in order that that time would come when he would be taken. And he would be nailed to that cross and he would hang in that middle tree. And he would put away sin by one sacrifice of himself. And when we trust in Christ, we can know the benefits of that atoning death. And what a glorious death it is, a death like none other. But if you look there at John 1.14 again, the last statement, it says that he was full of grace and truth. So when he came into the world, took our nature, dwelt among men, he was full of grace and truth. Now how are we to understand that phrase? What is that referring to? Well, if you just tie up verse 17 with that statement, because you'll find that those two terms appear once again in verse 17, so that they're so close together, the Lord isn't the author of confusion, so they're not unconnected. They don't just stand separately on their own and never are to be connected or taken together. There's, there's a connection here between the, the Lord Jesus being full of grace and truth. And then it says in verse 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So when we come to think about him being full of grace and truth, we're thinking about the contrast between the old economy under Moses and how they worshipped in the Old Testament times, compared to Christ in the New Testament era. It tells us there, verse 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. There's something that came with Jesus Christ that wasn't there before. And that's why John is telling us then in verse 14, he's full of grace and truth. It came with Jesus Christ, this fullness of grace and this fullness of truth. So what's in view here when we think about the fullness of grace? Well, when you come to think about the fullness of grace, is there not there the contrast with that Old Testament economy and system of worship? You see, the Old Testament economy was designed to teach mankind that they are sinners separated from God. That's the purpose for that whole system of worship. Well, one of the purposes. Maybe it's not just correct to say that's the purpose. It's one of the purposes for that whole system of worship because bloodshedding is is another one of the obvious purposes as well, to teach the importance of bloodshedding. But that Old Testament economy taught men and women that they were sinners separated from God. They, they could not approach on to God. There's the presence of God in the tabernacle or in the temple later on, and they could not approach on to him. They could only come so far, and they had to stop. They needed a priest to intercede for them. They needed a priest to go in and act on their behalf. They could not come of themselves. And that whole system of the tabernacle and then the temple worship was to teach mankind that we're separated from God and we're at a distance from Him. Hence the need of that earthly priest and the existence of a barrier, approach to God. As you know, there was the veil that was in the, the, the tabernacle proper that separated between the holy place and the holiest of all. And that veil hung there all down through Old Testament history from the day that it was instituted and made and hung up by by Moses when he was given the instructions at Mount Sinai and the veil was made, that veil hung there between the holy place and the holiest of all right down until the day that Christ died. And only that day was it rent in twain from top to bottom. And the rending of that veil from top to bottom signified the fullness of grace. There's a way opened up now into the holy place. There's no need of an earthly priest anymore. We don't need an earthly priest tonight. You don't need an earthly priest to bring you nigh to God. There's not an individual in all the world that needs an earthly priest tonight. All priests are defunct because of what Christ has done, because in him there's the fullness of grace. 
And he has opened up that way and that veil was rent in twain when he cried out those words, it is finished at that very moment. It was rent from top to bottom. And when we think about the veil, we're not thinking of some little flimsy cloth that's easily rent. That that veil was woven. It was a number of inches thick as it hung in the temple. It wasn't some just light curtain, you know, that blew about in the breeze. And when somebody opened the door and the wind came in, the the veil would, would flap about. No, it was inches thick. It hung as a barrier in the temple. As a, as a barrier between the holy place and the holiest of all. Until that moment Christ died. As he died as the sin offering at Calvary and cried out, it is finished. At that very moment, that veil, inches thick, was rent from top to bottom. It was, it was many feet in height. It wasn't possible for a, a man to stand on the ground and actually reach the top of the veil in the temple. It, it was many feet high. It wasn't possible for anybody to stand on the ground and to reach the top of that veil and to tear it of themselves, even if they had the power to rend it. No, the veil rent in, in twain from top to bottom. It was rent by God, signifying the fullness of grace that is in his Son, signifying that the way is now opened because Christ has come And in him there is the fullness of grace. And the emphasis in New Testament times now is reconciliation, not separation. Oh, there's still still the truth that men separated from God. That truth will always be in existence, that by our sins we're separated from God. But the emphasis now in the New Testament here is of access to God, of a way opened up into the presence of God. The veil is rent in twain. He's full of grace. But he's also full of truth. You see, the old system was as described as a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of those things. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1 tells us that. It was just a shadow of good things to come. It promised much. It had all those symbols and and types and shadows that were in the Old Testament system of worship, all pointing forward to something. But when Christ came, all of those promises were fulfilled. He was the substance. He was not the mere shadow. He was the substance. He was the reality. It tells you in Hebrews 9 and 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. He's the high priest of good things to come. He's the one full of truth. In the sense, he's the one who brings in the reality, the substance of all that was pre-shadowed, and prefigured in Old Testament times. You see, it is from Christ that we obtain all that we need to save our souls. And that will bring us to consider the blood that he shed and the cleansing power of that blood. But it is in Christ Jesus that a sinner finds all that they need to save their souls. They'll find in him a perfect righteousness. You'll you'll not find what you need to save your soul in a church or in a creed. But you'll find it in Christ. It's Christ a helpless sinner needs. It's Christ this world needs. The perishing in humanity need Jesus Christ. They don't need religion. There's plenty of religion in the world. They need the person of Jesus Christ. They need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They need the saving power of Jesus Christ. It's Christ they need. He's the substance. Miss Christ and you miss eternity in heaven. Miss Christ and you're a lost soul forever. It's Christ that we need. And tonight we rejoice 
in Christ incarnate. We rejoice in Christ incarnate. Yeah, he, he was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Word. The, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, he was God the Son, but He took our nature. He became the God man. And therefore, tonight there is a Savior, there is a Redeemer. There's one who's all that we need. There's nothing more that needs to be added. There's nothing more that needs to be done. Christ is all sufficient. And may we know that sufficient Savior. May we be able to say, we were singing that hymn this morning, weren't we? Uh, 312, my faith has found a resting place. And may we be able to the words of the chorus, I, I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. May that be our, our testimony tonight, it is enough. I have all that I need in Jesus Christ. I have all that I need. Is that our testimony? Oh, may it be so. If it is, then rejoice in Christ every day of your life. Give thanks to the Lord for Christ. He was made flesh. May the Lord bless his word.